Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, 24th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I make, ask all of you please to make sure your mobile phones are on silent? Uh, the first item is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to, to consider whether taking item four in private, which is consideration of our works programme. Do all members agree to that? Uh, Mike, you want to say something? Thank you, convener. Um, I don't agree to this. Um, unfortunately, I've agreed to every time we've moved into private session, I've given my agreement. And I don't want to give my agreement to move into private session again, um, because I, I, I think the work of the committee over the last two weeks has been undermined by a member of the committee. And um, we've got no, no belief that our meetings in private session will, be, will continue not to be undermined. And the reasons that it's being undermined is there hasn't been a leak from the committee, as, as reported in the press. The work of the committee in private session has been c clearly misrepresented with personal attacks on you, convener, for a, for a start. And uh, although you are personally uh, the most aggrieved, I'm sure, members of the committee, I, as a member of the committee, am aggrieved as well, because reading these reports in the press, clearly from a member of our committee, um, indicates that there's a grain of information in there that was private, even though the spin put on it wasn't true. And we've had no, from that person, we've had absolutely no commitment that this won't ha continue to happen. And I think it's completely undermined the work of the committee in private session because people out there are reading what's appearing in the press and that's what they think we are doing in private session, which is not true. So I would um, prefer that we took all our business in public session so the public could be assured that what we are doing is completely bona fide and completely right and completely appropriate because if we continue the way we are, um, that person on the committee uh, will continue, in my view, to undermine our work. Um, Mike, thank you. I, I take note. I, I'm prepared to take very short comments, and then I suggest, because a member of uh, this committee has uh, not agreed, that we'll need to go to a division on taking matters in private, because I will make the observation to you that there is matters uh, on item four, which is our work programme, which I have given as a personal undertaking as convener of this committee, that they would not be made public and, until we have had a chance to consider them. And so it would be inappropriate. So we will need to go to division. Stuart, would you like to make a comment? Uh, just to reinforce what you said, convener, just a very practical point. There are matters in the private paper related to our work programme, uh, which have been shared with us in confidence, which are not yet a matter of public record. And of course, may turn out to be preliminary and might subsequently be changed. And I think it's extremely helpful that others are giving us that uh, information to help the committee plan its work. We cannot discuss the paper that's before us in public. It would, if it, the committee were to conclude that this matter is to be discussed in public, this document would need to be withdrawn, the parts of it that have been shared in confidence removed, because we cannot discuss this paper without the paper being in public and we cannot publicise this paper. So I, notwithstanding any comments that, that Mike might say uh, on other matters, I think in the particular instance here, we cannot discuss the paper that is before us in public. Uh, Jamie, do you want to add anything? Thank you, Convener. Uh, I have sympathy for Mr Rumble's position on this, but committees in the Parliament must and should be able to meet in private to discuss matters of a wide range of nature. Uh, I would, however, impress upon all fellow members of the committee that anything that is discussed in private stays in private. Thank you. John. Yeah, well, um, as someone who really wants to see as much openness and transparency in, in all our deliberations, um, I think it would be important to say to anyone who's listening to this that it's on rare occasions we meet, that when we do meet it's to discuss uh, the merits of evidence and to come to a consensual point of view. That consensus and our ability to speak freely uh, will be curtailed if anyone breaches the confidences of that, and it would be very disappointing. But most importantly, um, if there is an agenda behind this, and I'm not necessarily convinced that there is, then the work of this committee will be frustrated 
if we don't go into private session. So I, I would encourage um, the collegiate nature of all our undertakings thus far to continue uh, and that uh, we do go ahead and consider the, the important matters of our work programme in private. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Mike, you've heard the views of the committee. Uh, do you wish to hold to your position on taking on not taking agenda item four in private? Well, consider. I mean, I hear what everybody is saying, but I do genuinely think that it's, our work has been misrepresented. The work that we've done in private session has been deliberately misrepresented by a member of the committee, and um, unless. If, if we just continue to ignore it, or if we just operate as we have done before, there's nothing to stop that person doing this exactly again. Had it happened just once, I'd have been inclined to agree with members. But this has happened twice in two weeks, and there's no indication from that individual member, to me certainly, that he will not continue to do just that. So um, I want to press this to a vote. I, I want to vote against it. Okay. So. We've, I, I've heard absolutely, uh, I think, a cross-reference views on that, and we'll go straight to a vote. Uh, and therefore, I would like to ask those members of the committee who agree to take item four in private to raise their hand, please. Those people who are against taking item four in private, please raise their hand. Therefore, there are ten votes in favour of taking item four in business and one vote... Uh, sorry? In private. Yeah. In, sorry, in private. And one vote against taking item four in private. Therefore, it's agreed to take item four in private. We'll move on to agenda item three, which is an item for the committee to take evidence on the investment to support Clyde and Hebrides ferry services. We'll take evidence this morning from two panels. We'll first hear from CalMAT Ferries and Caledonian Maritime Assets, who run the ferry services and own ferries in the infrastructure. And the committee will then take evidence from transport, tourism and community stakeholders. On the first panel, I'd like to welcome this morning Robbie Drummond, the Managing Director of CalMAT Ferries Limited, David McGiven, the Chairman of CalMAT Ferries Limited, Kevin Hobbs, the Chief Executive of Caledonian Maritime Assets, and Jim Anderson, the Director of Vessels, Caledonian Maritime Assets. Uh, now, we have a series of questions, and... Sorry? Oh! Robbie, I cut you off in your prime. I was going to give you... I was so keen to get to the questions, I, I failed to give you an opportunity to make a short opening statement of three minutes, and then I'm going to ask you, Kevin, to give a short opening statement. I apologise, Robbie, would you like to lead off with a statement of three minutes or less? Yes, thank you for that. I've just got a few remarks that I'd like to make. Um, when I appeared in front of this committee in May, I outlined the responsibilities of CalMAC to deliver our contract for Transport Scotland. I believe that increased clarity over who is responsible for each aspect of ferry services has enhanced the quality of debate among communities about the challenges we face. One of the main challenges is managing the impressive growth in carrying numbers we are seeing right across the network. While this has been enormously positive for communities, it has placed additional pressure on our fleet, which is already working to the very limit of its capacity. Just to provide some context to the committee, in the five years to 2017, the number of cars carried annually grew by 37% to 1.4 million, and passenger numbers have risen by 17% to 5.2 million. These were record carryings for CalMAC in 2017, and the growth trend has continued in 2018. During the peak months of June, July and August this year, traffic grew by a further 4%. This equates to more than 16,000 additional vehicles and 80,000 passengers during that three-month period. It is these additional volumes, combined with the delivery of a much higher number of sailings to deliver Transport Scotland's ferries plan, which is placing more and more pressure on our services, our vessels, and most importantly, on our staff. The consequence of managing higher volumes and higher sailings has significantly reduced our capacity to manage disruption, which, given the average age of the fleet, is inevitable from time to time. It should be said that we regret every instance of disruption, knowing that lives and businesses are being inconvenienced. 
However, I believe our record bears out a commitment to work with communities and local stakeholders to manage and minimise disruption and to clearly explain what is wrong and what we're doing about it. It is impossible to overstate the importance of lifeline ferry services to the long-term economic sustainability of remote and vulnerable island communities, and we very much welcome the committee's interest in the Clyde and Hebrides ferry service. As a business, we are working hard on short and medium-term measures to improve the technical resilience of our fleet. These measures include in-service maintenance teams, preventative maintenance regimes, and targeted investment to keep the vessels in full running order. However, communities want to understand the long-term strategy for the service and the impact that will have on their communities. We are committed to working collaboratively with Transport Scotland and the communities that we support to determine the best strategy for the future of the ferry service. From an operator's perspective, the standardisation of port infrastructure and ferry design to allow better flexibility in the deployment of the fleet would improve our resilience and also reduce the operating costs. Any future strategy must also therefore address trust, local authority and private ports to whom we pay millions of pounds in berthing fees. We also welcome the committees focused on accessibility. It is important to invest in facilities that enable ferry services to be used by all sections of the population. This is not easy with the ageing assets, but CalMic is absolutely committed to doing everything we can do to support our customers who may require additional assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie and Kevin. I'm Kevin Hobbs and I'm the Chief Executive of Caledonia Maritime Assets. Accompanying me today is Jim Anderson, our Director of Vessels. Caledonia Maritime Assets is more commonly known as CMAL. As the committee will be aware, CMAL is 100% owned by Scottish ministers. Transport Scotland are our sponsoring body and is represented by the Head of Ferries Unit, Graham Laidlaw. CMAL is an organisation that has responsibility for ferry assets for the Clyde and Hebridean ferry services, known as CHIFs, and the Northern Isles ferry services, known as NIFs. CMAL is based in Port Glasgow and has 31 employees. This is a small professional team that shows great dedication and commitment to support the lifeline services that our ferries provide. Our board comprises of four non-exec directors and four executive directors. As our name implies, we're the owner of maritime assets. CMAL does not operate the ferries. The day-to-day -day performance of the vessels is undertaken by commercial operators in terms of their public service contract, which is awarded by ministers. We have a total of 31 vessels currently operating in the CHIFS network. These vessels are chartered to the operator, CalMac. We have a total of five vessels operating in the NIFS network, three of which are owned by CMAL, purchased in April of this year, and two are bareboat chartered from a third party company called Fortress and sub chartered to the operator. The operator for NIFS is Circo Northlink Ferries. In addition, we own 26 port facilities located on the west coast which support the CHIFS network. The total number of harbour facilities on the west coast is 51, so we therefore have responsibility for just over 50% of the total. The harbours are operated by CalMac under a harbour operating agreement. We work closely with Transport Scotland, are in many instances their professional and trusted advisors within our specialist area of expertise. CMAL's financial memorandum does not permit us to borrow any money from any organisation other than Scottish Government without prior permission. We have a number of funding streams which can be categorised into three, three main ones. Number one is our revenue stream. CMAL as asset owner receives bareboat charter revenues, essentially lease payments from both CHIFs and NIFs ferry operators. We also receive harbour dues from the CHIFs operator and there are some minor revenue streams from third parties such as cruise vessels, fish landings and property leases. The second stream is voted loans for vessels. CMAL receives voted loans from Scottish Government in order to purchase vessels, either new buildings or second-hand tonnage, in accordance with long-term fleet renewal plans. The funds borrowed are paid back to the Government through the life of the vessel, plus a small interest rate. It is through such voted loans that our two vessels under construction at Ferguson Marina financed. The single exception to this is the vessel MV Lock C4 that was financed by Lloyds Bank and delivered into service in 2014 under a leasing structure. Our third stream is grant in aid for harbours. 
We receive grants from the government, which typically have an inter intervention rate of 75% of the capital project value. The funding of 25% comes from the CMR revenue streams mentioned previously. Grants are not paid back to the government. We hope this gives you a brief outline of our role and responsibilities, and we're now at your disposal to answer questions upon the investment by government into the Clyde and Hebridean ferry services. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And the, the, before we go into the first question, I mean, there are various members of the committee have questions, and they'll direct the question at the person they'd like to answer the question, I think, is the easiest way to do it. Um, and if any committee member wants to make a declaration of interest, uh, before they ask questions, uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll go ahead with that at the appropriate time. Uh, John, I think you're the first question. Um, thank you, Convener. And in advance of asking questions, can I make two declarations, please? Uh, one of the subsequent witnesses, Mr Roy Peterson, is a, a personal friend, and I'm also a member of the RMT parliamentary group, and I think both these are, are relevant to our deliberations today. Good morning, panel. Can I ask about, and, and indeed you used the term, uh, um, Mr Drummond, and that is about network resilience. Do you think the current level of investment um, is being used effectively to ensure network resilience? Um, I think probably what a way of answering that is to provide some, some evidence of, of, of where we are. The level of technical breakdowns across our fleet uh, and how we manage that is something that we work on, on day on day. The challenge that we're facing now is that the our ability to cope with those breakdowns and, and disruptions, whether they are technical or weather related, is much harder than it was in the past because of the huge number of passengers we're now carrying and also because of the additional sailings we're doing. So where in the past we had a bit of headroom, either on sailings or whether spare vessels, we had ability to cope with some of those disruptions. That is now much harder for us because we have no spare assets and our fleet is now working. And I say our fleet, I'm actually including our systems and our staff, are working at absolute capacity to manage the normal scheduled services. So the ability to cope with those breakdowns is much uh, more difficult for to manage than it has been in the past. Okay. Um, so uh, if, uh, can I repeat again then? So it, it, you're unhappy with the level of investment? that I think the challenge to us is we are managing the service as best we can with the assets we are being provided with. If you look at those investments, there is two, those two new vessels that were due to be put into service, um, A to one and A to two, that were due to be in service this year. That would have provided enormous new capacity for us and would have really improved our resilience. Because what that would have done is put two new larger vessels in place that will be new and resilient and offer additional capacity. But also that would have allowed us to do a cascade through the fleet um, that would potentially have freed up um, an additional vessel that could have been used as a spare vessel to be deployed in the event of any disruption. Now, clearly that hasn't happened and we're as disappointed as, the, uh, as our communities are that that's been delayed. But that investment, had it happened on time, would have made a significant difference. And if you add into that the, um, the new um, Isla vessel that's due to come, those three new vessels together would have made a significant difference to the resilience on our, on our fleet. I would also like to say it's not just um, vessels. We also look at resilience on, on ports because some of the challenges we're facing is um, that the ports were designed um, pre-RET and we are facing significant capacity problems in being able to manage normal timetable services but also when there's disruption, whether that's weather or technical, the ability to manage that disruption on the port, so marshalling um, cars and managing passengers, is much more challenging than it has been in the past. Okay, Mr Hobbs, would you care to comment on the, the level of uh, investment and whether it gives sufficient resilience at the moment? Yeah, I mean, um, in our professional opinion, there has been underinvestment, and I will say that up front. So, um, having said that, I think we have to balance that, really, and say um, I wouldn't like to be in the shoes of any government at the moment with limited funds, because, you know, choices have to be made. Of course, we live in the bubble of ferries, and... That's, that's what we're employed to do. However, that has to be balanced against you know, justice and, and uh, education and, and, of course, things like health. So, you know, w we are in a quite difficult place. I mean, the, co the costs which are, are widely reported um, for running the services in the past 10 years have an investment of over a billion. Um, now, if you actually look at CMAL um, itself, 
in terms of vessel investment in a 10-year period, we've had about £150 million pounds worth of investment. That includes the current vessels that are under, uh, under construction. Uh, we've also had harbour investments of about £50 million from, uh, from the government in the last 10 years. That has been topped up, as I mentioned earlier on, by our own revenue streams of about another £35 million. So, broadly, there's about £200 million, which is only 20% of the billion, is actually invested in the infrastructure which we have responsibility for. Um, there has been other investments with regard to trust ports and, and, and other assets, but we have no visibility of that as such. So, so there's 800 million goes on the subsidised services, and there's been 200 million um, invested, um, you know, through 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 CMAL. Um, in terms of looking at the sort of asset base, um, our our vessels, if we were to replace them all today, uh, the 31 plus the the two coming on stream, you will be looking at somewhere in the region of 850 million pounds. Um, an average life of vessel is about 30 years. Um, so. Sorry, not an average life. The, 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 the full life of a vessel is about 30 years. So that would indicate that overall there should be invested about £30 million per year in vessels, and we've received about half of that. We've also analysed our port infrastructure, and if we look at that over a 10-year basis, um, in our professional opinion, we need about £200 million. Now, some of that would come from our own revenue streams, of course, and the other from government. Looking at the numbers that I expressed earlier on, you have 50 million plus 35 uh, is 85 million, on average 8.5 per year, um, and we're saying that moving forward that it should be 20. So, in an overall sense, if we add the vessel um, investment up that we have seen in the last 10 years with the port investment, that is uh, is is significantly lower than we would than we would like. So, on average, 23.5 million pounds. And our professional assessment is it should be about fifty million pounds a year. Okay, thank uh, uh, John. Yeah. Have you got yeah, a follow -up? Yes, indeed. Can, can I briefly ask you then, please, to, to touch on look, looking a bit further forward and, and what that means in terms of investment, please? And if I just wrap another question in there, perhaps. Uh, and how that would tie in, and I know, Mr Drummond, you, you gave some input to this, with the, the Scottish Government's vision of the uh, islands position as laid out in the Island Scotland Act 2018, about uh, you know, vibrant, sustaining communities. I think, if I refer back to my, uh, my opening statement, I think what's important is that um, we work on what the future strategy looks like for both vessels and ports, and we're absolutely prepared to, to play a part in that. And that strategy has to look at where those, um, those much higher volumes are now happening, and also the island's aspirations for what they want for their, their economies. So it's a case of those communities coming together and working through what their future strategy needs to look like to be able to secure the economic sustainability that the islands want. And that's a tension that you're highlighting there, then, this growth in capacity and the actual implications for island communities. I think that, that is the tension, because in, in the past, we've been able to manage some of these, uh, both with weather disruptions and technical disruptions, we've been able to manage those. What's happening now is, while the level of those disruptions isn't significantly different, um, their impact is much greater than it has been in the past because the vessels that have been impacted are full. Uh, and that means when they are cancelled, it's much harder to deal with that level of disruption. So it's that pressure on our systems, our staff and vessels that's creating that real drive to have a look at what does that future strategy need to look like. Um, can I just ask a very quick question, please, to you, Mr Drummond? That is about the, the thousand people who are employed. Um, you have responsibility for them, Caledonia McBrain crewing? Yes, so we... Well, um, Why is that company registered in Guernsey? Oh, so we employ about... Um, we actually employ 1,700 people um, across the David McBrain group, of which the majority are delivering the CHIF service. Um, the... Registered in Guernsey? Yeah, so it's part of the group. It's registered in Guernsey... Why? Um, because it saves on national insurance. It is a government-sponsored scheme that um, uh, allows uh, British seafarers to, uh, or British seafaring companies to compete. Okay, thank so you that's, very much. It's in the public domain. It's been the same for a long number of years. Yes, indeed. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Briefly bring in Maureen, um, and, and then I want to ask a quick question of Kevin, and then go on to Stuart's next question, Maureen. 
If it's short, please. Yeah, so in terms of, you know, record number of passengers and things, obviously that's a good news story. It would also presumably mean um, record profits. Um, it would be interesting if we could have, after this meeting, um, a list of the ferries and their ages, um, because, you know, it's obviously not just in the lifetime of this government that there's been underinvestment in ferries. It would be previous to that, I mean, if there are 32 ferries, you would think you could space it out so that you were replacing a ferry um, a year if there's a 30-year um, lifespan. So I wondered if we could have that uh, chair after the meeting. That would be good. Can I just ask a question, just of you? You said that there was underinvestment, um, and, and you were quite clear on the level of underinvestment. Uh, when was the last time that was brought forward to the government and, and how often has that been brought forward to the government as, as your view in the last six years? Um, I can only talk about the last two and a half years, which is how long I've been employed. Um, but I'm sure my predecessors would have brought it to the attention. As I mentioned in my opening statement, we have um, our sponsoring body is Transport Scotland. So we report through the ferry unit. Um, we have monthly meetings with the ferry unit um, and indeed with CalMAC. We have a tripartite meeting which lasts most, most of the day um, and there is a full open and frank discussion every month about the type of level of investment that needs, that there needs to be. Um, what we're not 100% sure of, of course, is how that then gets translated up to, up to the minister or, or up to the upper echelons of Transport Scotland. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we certainly bring it to the attention of um, Transport Scotland and we do meet with ministers from time to time but there you're probably talking two or three times a year. So you will have done it monthly for two and a half years and your predecessor probably done it monthly prior to that. Okay we're, we're pushed for time on this so I'm, I'm going to go to the next load of questions which is from Stuart. Um, as, as we've covered some of the infrastructure already I do just, oh, sorry, I must uh, declare I'm Honorary President of the Scottish Association of Public Transport, um, which is an unremunerated uh, position. Um, it, just to understand the capacity point, on RET, how does the actual growth in traffic uh, map uh, with the predictions that were made at the time RET was introduced. And I, just for completeness, say I was the minister who introduced it, and I don't remember the answer to my question. Um, Either you or David, is no, it? I, I can answer that. So, well, first of all, we don't know how much growth is related to RET and how much is related to growth in the economy. Uh, and if you go and talk to Visit Scotland, they are seeing huge numbers of more visitors coming to Scotland, which can only be a uh, only a good thing. So we don't actually know how much of that growth is related to RET and how much is growth in the economy. I, I, would, I would say that the level of growth we've experienced is, taking these two things together, is, is way in excess of what was predicted perhaps three or four years ago. I think that's safe to say. If you look at growth rates now across six years, in excess of 40% across the whole network. If you look at some islands, the growth is actually getting way over 50%. 55%. So you look at those kind of growth rates. Essentially, we're operating, we've had one additional ferry in that, uh, over that period, Log Seaforth, but essentially we're operating with the same number of assets, um, running more sailings, but carrying that much level of, much higher level of volumes. Uh, okay, let me just move on to some other matters. Uh, and I think this is again for CalMAC. Um, one of the issues that uh, has arisen is integrating various transport modes, because clearly, uh, many of the ports, mainland ports in particular, uh, into which Carmack sail passengers and in particular will have to integrate with buses and trains and so on and so forth. Um, how, how are you seeking to improve that? Um, I, I know that there's, there's work going on uh, to uh, provide through ticketing to a greater extent than is currently the case. Um, are you satisfied that we're, we're doing all that we need to do on that? Are there other things that require other people to do things? Well, I think there's, there's two aspects there. The first one is the unintegrated transport. So we have appointed, as that was part of our bid commitments, to appoint a transport integration manager. And it's their role to work with, with communities, but also work with, with ScotRail and the bus companies to try and ensure that timetables are properly aligned. So where there is a railhead into ferry, that those times are properly aligned, 
and that there's buses on the other end that are again more aligned. That's easier on the mainland than it is perhaps in the islands where they're it's more difficult. So we are working very hard with, uh, to make sure that happens. On the integrated ticketing side, I think the evidence I gave last time to the committee was our ticket system is um, past the end of life. And again, that is one of the challenges on trying to manage that level of capacity is our ticketing system is not no longer um, doing what we need it to do. Um, if we had a new modern ticket system, that would then enable us to do smart tickets, to have new channels for passengers, but also make, to make them smart and integrated. So it would allow us to integrate properly with trains and properly with buses. Um, but our ticket system at the moment just cannot facilitate that. Can I just take you back to timetables? Um, and I hear what you said about the coordination of the timetables, <laughs> but I think uh, for many passengers, the issue often arises when there are delays on either side of whatever the mode is. How, how are you ensuring that uh, it is still possible for people to have a reasonable through journey in conditions of operational difficulties that might be the rail company, might be the bus company, or might be uh, CalMac? Or, or it, so, in, indeed, Northern Ferries would come into the, uh, uh, Northern so, Isles would come into this as well. So the way we manage that is we've got operating protocols with the bus companies and with the rail companies. And those protocols work through what happens when either the ferry's late or the buses or trains are late. So this communication goes between us and then we've got operating protocols as how we manage that. During the day, that's actually very challenging because if we delay a sailing by 20 minutes, that means the next sailing is 20 minutes late, which means a whole lot of new customers may then miss their connections. So we try and manage it through. Uh, we particularly focus on the end of day sailings to make sure that those end of day sailings, if there's buses or trains are connecting with those end of day sailings, that the ferry will absolutely wait for those, those connections. And then we've got protocols as to how we try and manage that during the day to, to make the best we can do for customers, but without <coughs> disadvantaging future customers on that, that day sailings. So do, do you have adequate knowledge of your passengers' travel plans? Uh, just for the sake of argument, people coming into Auburn um, might be getting on the sleeper. Do you know they have to get in the sleeper? Um, no, we don't know that information. So we know it because we're in contact with um, the rail company or the bus company. Um, and on some routes, we do have that information. So we are told the bus has left and it's this number of passengers are connecting. Um, but on other routes, we don't have that information because we don't have smart and integrated ticketing that might give you some of that. So it all comes back to having a more up-to-date computer system and better knowledge of the passenger's travel journey and the role that you play a part in delivering. And I think that's right, but there's a significant amount we've already done through having protocols and having communications, uh, communication protocols, again, with bus and train companies as to when they're leaving and when services might be running late. So. Um, right, let me just move on. And I think this is fairly brief. Uh, one of the things that uh, respondents to a committee inquiry uh, on the islands in particular have said that uh, they are being discriminated against. I'm not entirely clear uh, what that might mean. We've heard some of the numbers. Is that something that uh, you're hearing? And if so, uh, what, what, what was it? Maybe starting with Seamal, although I think Seamal's relationship with individuals is perhaps less, so it might be the operator. Perhaps pick that up. Um, first of all, our contract that we have with Transport Scotland explicitly states that all passengers are given equal access to our services. So it is run on an absolutely first come, first serve um, basis if you're booking or turning up. And that is the way our contract runs. I think the communication you've had is some islanders are now finding it difficult to be able to get on the sailings of their choice and be able to make you know, medical appointments, hospital appointments, whatever else it is. And that's perhaps what that conversations coming from that islanders are now finding it harder to get to if, have if, regular travel. Yeah, if I may, I think it's it's more an emergency journey, you know, possibly to a funeral, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. How do you deal with that? Because I think that is the source of this particular discontent. So I say if our contract says explicitly we um, we have to deal with first come first serve. So when there is an emergency, absolutely we'll do all we can do to facilitate that. Uh, in particular we can look at moving and what we do is try and move commercial traffic to different sailings. Um, so we do try and create space if the ferry is full for those emergency sailings. And, and we do nearly always manage to accommodate those um, by, by just sensible management of traffic. 
Just before we move on, Kevin, do you want to comment on the investment and, and, and the, that specific point made by uh, people to the, to the committee was, uh, um, just let me make sure I get this exactly right, that, that in terms of investment priorities, uh, respondents to the committee's survey, that islanders are being discriminated against by their, their location. Do you think they're, they're getting good value for their investment uh, in the ferries? Well, with the backdrop of, of what I said before and um, underinvestment, then you know, obviously it would be nice if we had more money. Um, I'm not aware that people are being discriminated against, other than what Robbie has said, which is you know access to ferries in emergency situations, because you know a little bit like an EasyJet flight when it's full, it's full. So you know there is there is a bit of a problem there, um, no doubt. Um, but you know we we basically going back to my original. Um, statement, um, we can only spend what we're allowed to spend. Uh, so, so from our perspective, you know, yes, we would like to spend more, we would like to deliver more, but all of our funding, bar the lock Seaforth, has always come from the government, of, of whichever colour it's been, um, for, for the whole of our existence. So, you know, we, we put in compelling bids for funding, um, for ships and for ports, and you know, sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. It goes back to this balance of, of you know, where the priorities lie, you know, in terms of, you know, ferries within Transport Scotland or within the greater range of, of Scottish government's spend. Next question is Richard Larp. Richard. Yes, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, you've got 32 ve uh, vessels with an average age, age of 22 years. So, by my counting, the first vessel was built in 1996, uh, well before the establishment of this parliament and under another parliament. Um, but OK, there's been underinvestment for the last 20 years. I would like a list, as my f f uh, colleague uh, asked, a list, name of the vessel, age of build, where it operates of those uh, uh, vessels, and then we could look at it. So, but you've also highlighted um, usage has grown significantly Surely you're tracking growth over the last number of years and, and know that local communities need to use ferries daily. So can I ask what engagement was undertaken with local communities and decisions over procurement of new ferries and how were these views taken into account? Richard, is that to Kevin? As yeah, seems. well, to, ever, uh, to Kevin <coughs> mainly. Yeah. Uh, Robbie, is, he operates them. I'll take that first, I suppose. I mean... When it comes to new ferries or new port infrastructure, then we are duty bound for all sorts of reasons to communicate with communities. So, you know, um, in terms of ports, there might be harbour revision orders and it is a statutory obligation to consult. Um, it's exactly the same with, with ferries. Um, so we have to consult, we undertake um, stag assessments, etc. So, you know, I think the level of con uh, consultation is, is high. Um, if we take our our most recent uh, series of consultations is re in regard to the Sky Triangle, which is Uig, Loch Maddy and Tarbert Harris. And, you know, we've been out on the network um, uh, on three separate occasions now, um, literally for a road trip for a week, um, to consult and hear what people's views are. And that then um, informs us as, as, as to what is required. Um, however, we, we fundamentally have to go back to the fact that we have no borrowing powers. What we would like to do in an ideal world um, doesn't always come to fruition. You know, we, we could, if we sat down with a blank sheet of paper, you know, yes, we would like to do many, many things. However, um, unless the government of, of whatever nature it is, now and in the future, funds us to do that, then we can't deliver anything. And that is, that is just a fact. Uh, would you agree with a comment I'm going to make? Um, I think in, in some ways you're hoisted with your own petard. You're, yeah, a vessel financed by Lloyds Bank in 2011 that cost you £42 million, but existing port infrastructure was unable to accommodate the larger vehicle, requiring upgrades at a cost of £32 million. So why have procurement decisions favoured fewer larger vehicles that require upgrades in port infrastructures rather than smaller vehicles, which would give you more flexibility to operate across a wider ne network and would save you spending a fortune in upgrading the, the, the harbour. I think my recommendation moving forward, given that there is a lack of money, is that what you're describing is correct. So, 
If we're looking at the new vessel for ILA, which Mr Yusuf announced uh, on the 4th of April of 2018, um, we're, we're actually looking at uh, repli not replicating the, the current Finlagon because time has moved on. Um, however, um, the displacement, the length, the draft, the beam, etc., etc., is, is broadly going to be the same. So, from our perspective in CMAL, um, if, if we find that there is not enough money to do everything, I, I think it is fair to say that if you build a bigger vessel, inevitably that means that you have to do major port work. Where we're moving to at the moment is not to do that major port work, but to have vessels that are broadly similar to those that are currently operating. We can't turn back the clock on what's happened before. And I, I, I also think there is one other a, uh, sort of aspect to this which people tend to miss, is that if you look at the Sky Triangle, which I mentioned earlier on, if you look at the facilities at Uig, or Tarbert, Harris, or Lochmaddy, all of those are nearing life expiry. They are absolutely safe. We make sure that that is the case, and so does Carmack. We would not... Safety is our number one priority. However, um, you know, people seem, seem to believe that because there is a new bigger ship coming, work absolutely ha had to be done. That's a bit of an urban myth, actually. What, what needed to be done is all three of those facilities were nearing life expiry anyway. So whether they had a new ship or they didn't have a new ship, work would needed to have been done. Before you go on, uh, I think Robbie wanted to come in on that. Could we, could we hear from Robbie on that? Yeah. It's covered the um, technical process around consultation. I think my response would be this. You've raised some very good points there. Uh, and what I would like to see is a longer-term strategy that actually addresses what is the shape of the ferry service that we want in the next 30 years, whether that's small vessels or, um, um, or, or something different. What does that strategy look like? And then you then place that investment programme within that broader strategy. Yeah, I, I think the last time someone came to this committee and they said we're trying to secure a, a, a v, a vessels in, in, in the wider world, um, these vessels couldn't cope with it, our infrastructure and couldn't, you know, weren't suited for you know, our harbours or slipways or whatever. And so you, you have to, you know, at the end of the day, I think you need to tell us what you need so that we can press p other people to get what you want. Uh, lastly, uh, through you, convener, were the costs of port infrastructure upgrades and harbour dues associated with new vessels fully accounted for in the ferry procurement decisions? Go with that. Um, uh, probably Kevin, is it? I think the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Colin, you've got a follow-up for the next question. It's just so we're clear, though, you seem to be implying that um, overall it's worked out more expensive, given that the improvements to, to harbours and ports, it's worked out more expensive by going down a route of larger vessels than it would have been had you procured, for example, two smaller vessels because of, you wouldn't have required that work. So has it been more expensive to go down that route of going for the larger vessel than it would have been had you gone for smaller vessels? The answer is it could be. Um, what I've described with the Sky Triangle, I think, is, is fairly clear. Um, whether there was a new ship or not, or whether there was a second-hand ship that went on there, or whether the service frequency increased, those particular ports were in need of upgrade and investment in any event. So, um, however, if we look at it in a broad sense, what we seem to be seeing is that if you have a vessel such as the Glen Sanex or its sister 802, that... Um, that's £48.5 million, and broadly, to upgrade Brodick and Ardrossan is a similar amount of money. Um, so, you know, going back to my original comment, um, the recommendation and what we're discussing at the moment at our network strategy group meetings, which is a monthly meetings I've mentioned before, is actually looking at what does get you the best value for money. And, and certainly, having a £50 million ferry and then having to do work to upgrade ports for £50 million very simply equals £100 million. My personal opinion is, at the moment, given the average age of the fleet, which I can bore you with in a minute if you wish me to, um, it would be better to buy two new ferries and not do the work on the ports. Uh, you're certainly not going to bore us on the age of the fleet and everything. You're going to submit that on a, on a written bit of paper, so we've all got it. Um, I want to bring in Peter first and then John. Um, 
Sorry, and, and it's not boring. It is an interesting fact. It's just we haven't got the time to go through it. Peter. Thanks, Janet. Uh, I mean, I think we've, we've all been speaking to, to some extent about the Olapool Stornoway situation. Why, why, it would appear that the public opinion, the public view was that two smaller vessels would have been a better investment, would have given you more flexibility, rather than what you have done is invest in a big, big new uh, vessel and then invested in the, in the port facilities because you had to. It seems that you've disregarded the, the, the views of the travelling public when you made that decision. Was that... It's not our decision at the end of the day. We are the advisors and we can say what we feel. Stag reports were done. Um, I know that people in the islands, I wasn't actually employed at that time. It's way, way before my time. Um, so Robbie has been employed for a lot longer. But um, I suppose at the end of the day, it all comes down to funding. So yes, people on the islands may have wished to have two smaller vessels. Um, the Lock Sea Forth cost £42 million to build. It was financed, as we said, by Lloyds Bank and not in the, the normal voted loan way. Um, a decision was made to, to go with that because at the time they believed that the capacity would be met by that vessel. It was designed to operate 24 hours a day. So there are two passenger services through the daylight hours, we'll call it, and then there's the night freight run. Um, but if you would have had two vessels on that route, you would have probably ended up with a capital cost of, at the time, two lots of £35 million. Pounds. So it would have been 70 versus 42. Um, and then you look at the ongoing revenue support or subsidy to run ferries of that nature. Um, if you look at, say, the, the crewing element, which is not my responsibility, but two, two, two lots of crews for the lifetime of a vessel or lifetime of two vessels versus one, again, is a huge amount of money. And, and, you know, we're living in a world day to day at the moment where, you know, there isn't enough money to do what everybody wants to be done. But then you wouldn't have had to spend the money upgrading the port. If you had stuck, stuck with the two similar sized vessels, you would have saved that, whatever it was, 40 million in the port. I, I, to be honest with you, I can't, I, I, can't, I can't comment. I don't know exactly how much other pool and, and stone away cost, but... Can I... Can I, Can I make a comment, um, I, I was at the time the stag appraisal was done. Uh, you're talking about Stornoway, Ullapool. Um, the communities were consulted at the time, and I remember there was quite a lengthy debate, and two exercises were done. There was a feasibility study done on the one vessel option, which is what we've ended up with, and there was the same feasibility study and figures done on the two vessels, the two smaller ones to which you're referring. Um, I think the decision could have gone either way, but the decision that was made at the time by the government was to go for the large vessel. That was their decision. Um, had the decision been to go for two smaller vessels, we would have operated it. But that was the decision at the time. I mean, briefly. No, just make a quick comment there. I was technically responsible for the design and build of the, the Lock Seaforth. And if, if you're looking at, from a naval architecture point of view, a longer, more slender vessel. It's not just the crew costs that we have to consider here for two vessels. It's much more fuel efficient as well. So there, there's great savings in having larger, more slender, hydro, hydrodynamically designed vessels. And that's another uh, aspect that was taken into consideration. And, and we do have all those numbers of the committee. Want to see any of the numbers that make the comparison against large vessels, small vessels, you know, crewing, and we have to take that into consideration with the costs of the upgrades to the ports. It's very, very important. So can I, can I just see if I can uh, wrap up a, a question here, is that if I remember rightly, there was a Transport and Infrastructure and Climate Change Committee review of ferries carried out in 2008, and then there was a ferries review carried out by the government and we still seem to be arguing about what should be delivered, where, when and how, and in what shape or form. So, uh, well, discussing rather than arguing, maybe better to say. So I have a question for you, uh, probably to you, Kevin, is given, given taking into account those two bits of work, and obviously the ongoing problems that we're having at the moment, and we're seeing... Uh, with Ferguson Marine and, and the issues of the procurement for, for the vessels there and perhaps the cost overruns that are mentioned in the papers. 
Do you believe that the procurement decisions that have been taken provide good value in money in terms of increasing long-term and capacity and resilience for the ferries in Scotland? The, the simple answer is yes. Um, I mean, you've referred to cost overruns um, with regard to the current ferries that are being purchased. So um, our comment with regard to that is that I'll hand over to Jim to explain to you very briefly the tendering process. But you know, very, very simply, there is a tendering process. We then contract and, and, and then we build. If I can give you some background to that, it was uh, uh, the end of 2014 when we actually went out to tender for these two new vessels and um, we received actually seven bids, in fact two bids from one, one yard, um, so six yards with seven bids in total and of those seven bids, Ferguson's bid was the outstanding bid of them all. Uh, you know, when we do the evaluation based upon quality and cost, it was the, the outstanding that clearly demonstrated that, that, that Ferguson's completely understood what they were to deliver from this design and build contract. So certainly at the time of placing the contract, uh, Ferguson's you know, demonstrated they knew exactly what was required and they knew the timescales. I okay, sorry. If... I, I just want to push back slightly on the first bit. That, that you know, in 2008, the, the current committee, then looking at ferries, decided on on a way forward. The government did a ferries uh, 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 review, and consequently, you're now saying that we probably got the wrong vessels. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm commenting not on Ferguson Marine. I'm commenting whether it's bigger or smaller vessels, and we might have been better with smaller vessels. It seems to be a bit of confusion here. Uh, Kevin, would you like I don't to think, comment? No, on? I, I, I don't think it's confusing. I mean, the decision was made to build two bigger vessels on 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 a, on a cost basis. Um, you know, there are some extra costs if you're looking at climate change of doing what we do. Um, we were the first. Uh, company in the world to have uh, electric diesel hybrid vessels um, you know and the vessels that are being built at Ferguson's are the first LNG vessels that, that um, are being built in the UK although it is not new technology there are many many vessels um, we did some analysis recently and you know there's 2,000 engine sets for dual fuel vessels have been bought throughout the whole wide world so you know we we again we report to Transport Scotland who in turn uh, reports to, uh, to the Scottish Government, and there is an absolute desire to reduce carbon footprint. So that is, a, that is an element that we have to take into account when, uh, when we're making decisions, H hence the dual fuel. OK. Um, Colin. Just to follow up on that, though, there has been criticism that when you did procure those ferries, um, the design has changed significantly since that process. Are you absolutely clear that what you procured is exactly what has effectively been delivered? Why has there been a need for such a significant change in design? There has been no significant changes in design. That's quite clear. So, it, so what you're reading is yeah. untrue. So why has the cost increase and why are the delays in your interpretation? That's really one you would really have to ask Ferguson's. Um, you know, we have a clear, for, clear contract. You, you, we, don't, you don't actually know, though. Well, I think we can all look at it and say that a project which was supposed to be delivered in 31 months hasn't been delivered in 31 months. Uh, the second ship is, is much later. We've got a delivery date of 2020. So if any project which was had a timescale of 31 months and 33 months is now being extended to 44 months and, and 52 months, of course, there's going to be cost overruns. It's quite clear, isn't it? If a project takes almost twice as long as it was envisaged, there will be cost overruns. And none of those overruns have got anything to do with the design? None whatsoever. Okay. Okay. Um, John Finney, followed by Jamie Green, and then we must move on. Uh, thank you. A question for Mr Anderson, I think, and it follows on from the convener's one about procurement, and it also aligns with, uh, um, if you like, vessel design process. Why are the trade unions not involved in either the vessel design process or the procurement process? 
Well, maybe I ask Robbie to maybe uh, give us assistance to answer that. Certainly, how we work along with CalMAC is we define a set of operational requirements. So we don't have the direct, you know, link with the unions. But perhaps Robbie might be able to say something about that. Um, I can't see why they shouldn't be. I can't comment on procurement. Um, that's clearly something that sits with with um, CMA and has a you know, more legalistic impact. But I can't see why the unions shouldn't be involved in determining what is our future strategy going forwards. I mean, if I can just, just answer a little bit of that as well. Um, there are very defined international regulations under the ILO rules which define exactly what type of accommodation and what quality it has to be. And we absolutely follow that because if we didn't follow it, we, we would not be certified to operate a vessel. Yeah, well, for the voice, th thank you for that, uh, Mr. Hobson. For the voice of doubt, I wasn't exclusively referring to that, but I, I think perhaps yourself, Mr. Drummond, I may stand to be corrected if it's not, have, have answered similarly previous to a question when I've asked that. Uh, the Minister, indeed, Cabinet Secretary, has answered that. So can I just take it that the next time that there's a vehicle design or procurement process, you will invite the RMT and other unions along? I think we should invite consultations from all our communities, and that would include our unions. So, yes. Thank you very much. In a brief question, and then we're going to move on to Colin. Thank you, uh, Convener. Can I ask a uh, good morning, panel? Uh, Mr. Hobbs, um, when were CMAL uh, first advised by Ferguson Marine that they were experiencing difficulties uh, with the delivery of Halls 801, 802, and, and specifically that they might go over the £97 million budget that you had allocated in the contract? And do you know what the final cost of the delivery of these two vessels might be as the customer and who's liable for the overruns? Uh, yeah, I can be very explicit on that. We were, we were advised in July of 2017, so some 15 months ago, um, that there were cost overruns. Um, we, because we have a, a team embedded in the yard anyway, we, we knew well in advance of that that things were not going according to plan. Um, I think we need to be very, very clear on the, the type of contract which we, we tendered for and we uh, eventually signed. Um, it is a design and build contract, number one. Uh, number two it is a fixed price, which is out in the public domain of £97 million. Um, and it has some fixed dates for delivery. And if it is not delivered on time, then there are liquidated damages. Now, those liquidated damages go beyond lateness. Um, they extend to uh, excessive fuel use when it comes to sea trials, um, deficiency of dead weight, and deficiency of speed. So there are a number of things at the end of the contract which we, we will have to weigh up. Um, I would reiterate, um, it was known from stage one when we went to the European Journal and the PQQ and the ITT and the contract, it was a fixed price contract. Now, Ferguson Marine, along with everybody else that were actually bidding for that contract at the time, they're private companies, and with a private company, there is risk and reward. They signed up to that contract knowingly and willingly, and as far as we're concerned, 97 million is what we have to pay. We can, of course, um, estimate with our own knowledge, myself and Jim between us have, unfortunately, given our age, probably got 60, 70 years of experience. So we, we, we can judge that it will be costing an awful lot more. Um, our assertion at this particular point in time is that is not our problem. That is the problem of a private company that knowingly and willingly bid for these vessels. And we feel that we've been extremely honourable. We haven't gone to the press. We haven't moaned and groaned. So, you know, we, we, are, we are keeping quiet on it because we, we've got nothing really to say. But definitely, 15 months ago was when we were officially informed that these ships were going to cost more. To uh, park that one there and move on to the next question with with Colin, and then we'll take a question. We'll take two further questions. Now, I absolutely warn you at this stage, we're not going to get through all the questions, uh, for which I'm very sorry. Uh, but we'll have to write to you, and we'd ask you to respond promptly, or the clerks will write to you with the questions. So, Colin, if you could uh, keep your questions simple, that would be helpful. Very, very briefly, um, it's just on the issues of um, the budgets for harbour improvements. Uh, Mr Hobbs, in your opening comments, um, you made reference to the fact you had received £50 million of government funding towards harbour improvements. Um, 
has CML received any commitment from Transport Scotland of, of any further investment within the, the ferries budget for harbour improvements? Uh, and Mr Drummond, you mentioned um, in your opening comments um, the, 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 the importance of trust local authority and privately owned harbours being involved in any future strategy. Can you explain to the, the, the committee at the moment what you mean by that and basically to what extent are CalMAC currently involved in discussions with them in terms of harbour improvement works? Okay. At the outset, if that was a short question, I'm never going to ask for a long one, so if I could have a short answer, please, because I have two questions which I would like to get in. So who's going to start with that? Robbie, is that you? You can answer Okay. I mean, it's an ongoing iterative process in terms of port investment. So, as I said um, earlier, we put in compelling bids in terms of for, for funding for both vessels and, and for ports. And um, sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. So the most recent um, funding letter with, which we received related to the replacement of the common drive and rebutt slipways um, and, and some ancillary work that needed to be done. Um, Anything that you do in a marine sense, whether it's ships or whether it's ports, become very expensive. Um, you know, two concrete slipways, believe it or not, six million quid. You know, it is, it is an expensive thing to do and it takes a long time. Um, and we are discussing with Transport Scotland at the moment a number of further bids. Um, we have a number of ports which are nearing life expiry. Um, Tarbot Harris is one on the Sky Triangle. Gurukh is another, Armadale is another, I can go on. So we have 26 ports, we've got seven or eight which are within five years of having to be replaced. So, you know, that, that, is, that is the world that we live in um, and that's the sort of, sort of money that, you know, is involved. Our biggest product project was Brodick, um, that cost £31 million. You know, these are, these are big numbers supporting the island communities. Robbie? Robbie, briefly, please. Yeah, I can answer very, very shortly from an operator perspective. And the reason I mentioned other ports in my opening statement is the challenge we face on running to ports that are all of very different designs. And if we had consistency of those ports, whether they're CMAL ports or local authority, then that would make our job much more efficient. It's probably also worth stating um, that those ports have got a requirement to be fit for purpose. We pay £33 million a year in berthing and traffic juice to these variety of different ports, and it's up to them to keep those facilities fit for purpose for our, our services. Colin, yeah. You, you talk about being fit for purpose. Uh, Mr Hobbs, you mentioned uh, the Broderick Terminal. So how do you respond to concerns that we've had that, that the Broderick Terminal isn't fit for purpose? Um, we, we have had feedback, um, certainly. Um, we, we consulted widely prior to to sending out to tender and building it. Um, the vast majority of the comments relate to the passenger access system, which is 210 metres long, uh, versus the previous one, which was about 60 metres long. Um, the nature of the build and the way that the ship ties up now um, with the new finger pier, um, th there is nothing more that we can do um, not wishing to stray into operational um, areas. If people with accessibility needs require assistance, then CalMAC is there to help. So, I mean, th there, was, there was really no other way than having um, quite a long um, passenger access system in, in a relative sense. However, um, being Gatwick a couple of weeks ago, you know, please take 15 to 20 minutes to get to your gate. So 200 and 210 metres is, is, is not 15 minutes worth of walking. However, I think we all have to appreciate if you have accessibility needs, yeah. then you know, 210 metres is, is a long way. Bring in the Deputy uh, Convener just to ask a quick question on that. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. It fits in quite nicely with what I was going to ask. Um, Carl Mack, in your submission, you said that um, the issue of ageing populations and with it an increase in people facing mobility challenges already being felt. Um, and I'm quite willing for you to follow this up and write into the committee if you can't answer it immediately at the moment. Um, do you have any numbers of the increase in passengers with mobility issues? Um, 
what consultation have you had with disability groups and what improvements, given that we're doing budget scrutiny, do you think need to be made across the fleet, both in ports and ferries? And how much do you think extra you would need to fund this? Okay. I've got a feeling you might want to write to us. That was um, quite, quite a long series of questions. If I can make a couple of brief comments that, um, you know, we do work very hard to support th those customers who got, um, uh, need additional assistance. And that is growing. We are seeing more of that. We are working with Disability Equality Scotland on an assisted travel policy that's been very well uh, accepted and regarded in the industry. We're also working with um, Transport Scotland and other bodies on regional, uh, create regional access groups that are going to create some short-term action plans that are going to address collectively what we all can do in the transport industry to make those, um, make those uh, traveling public have a better experience. But that's something I can expand on a bit in, in writing, if that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, on, on new vessels, for all new vessels projects, when we carry out our stakeholder engagement, we are having engagement with all the accessibility panels from all the areas, and, and we're building in everything we possibly can do within the constraints of vessels. You know, we're putting in additional lifts, changing room toilets, access through all areas of the vessel. So we're really, we're really trying to accommodate everything we possibly can do. Thank you, Jim. And, and again, the clerks will clarify the, the questions that we'd like answers for. I'm going to briefly and finally bring in John, and then I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, give my excuses to the members I haven't been able to bring in and say that we'll submit written questions. So, John. Right, going back to demand uh, and the uh, road equivalent tariff, um, has, it's been hugely success, successful as far as I can see. It has boosted demand. Has it just been too generous? Do we need to curtail it? And that would bring demand back down and make all of your lives a bit easier? Yeah, I think you're getting into to, to matters of policy there. And clearly it has been very successful and that has had a huge impact on, on island communities. But we are facing into those pressures and how we manage that on, on vessels. Uh, and there is options to look at managing that demand. So there's options to look at uh, around pricing perhaps. There's options to look at which traffic you allow on different vessels. But that's getting into real policy issues that will certainly be challenging for some, some areas of the community and, and might be attracted by others. So it's trying to balance off the islands, balance off um, uh, those traveling for tourism reasons. And there's the things we could do to manage that demand better. So there is options that we can discuss with, with communities if that's, if that's going to be an attractive option. Could I add something here? Yeah, David. Um, the final there, word. There is no doubt that it's been a great success, and that's that's great for the communities, it's great for the islands, it's great for tourism, it's great for the economy. It has caused pressures, but again, I think Robbie referred to the point earlier, um, the two new vessels that Kevin talked about were scheduled to be in, uh, in service uh, this year. That would have been a huge help to us in terms of the size of the fleet, flexibility, being able to cascade down. Uh, and to give you a simple example, when, when the Seaforth came in, uh, the, Isle of, uh, the Isle of Lewis became available, we had discussions with uh, Transport Scotland. Uh, they wisely took the decision to retain the vessel, they could have sold it, and that vessel was then deployed to give a dedicated service to the island of Barra, and having been in Barrow a couple of times since then, if you talk to the locals up there, having its own service daily has been a huge boost to the island. So if we get the capacity, we can help and we can work with the islands. I think if I could just, just make one final comment. The, um, there is no doubt it has been a success, but from an infrastructure and asset point of view, incrementally, every lorry that goes over a link span, every car, every passenger that goes up a passenger access system, it does put greater pressure on the system and, and things are, are wearing out quicker than they ordinarily would have done. And that is just the nature of, of what we're doing. It's, it's like putting more miles on a car. You know, you, you expect to have to, you know, maintain it more regularly, etc., etc. So, you know, that is a, it is, it's something which we're having to deal with. It is costing us more money, um, but, you know, to support the islands, our view within CMAL, and I'm sure Carmack, is it's worth it. And I'm afraid we are going to have to stop there. there. There will be a list of questions that will be circulated by the clerks, and I'm afraid they will give you a very tight...
time scale as far as responses to those are concerned, but that is to fit in with our time scale for post our pre budget scrutiny. So I apologise for that in advance, but look forward to see, receiving your responses. And I'd like to thank you for coming uh, to the meeting today and giving evidence. I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow witnesses to change over, but I would ask committee members to stay present in the room so we can move straight on. Thank you very much. Um, again, and I welcome the second panel of our, for our pre-budget scrutiny item. I welcome Angus Campbell, Chair of Calmac Community Board, Ranald uh, Robertson, Partnership Director, Highlands and Islands Transport Partnership, Roy Pedersen, Author and Consultant, and Rob McKinnon, Chief Executive, Outer Hebrides Tourism. Uh, we are, have got a lot of questions, and uh, I 
panel, uh, the committee members will, will ask questions and will direct them at the person they would like to uh, answer it to. If anyone else wants to answer, would they try and catch my eye? I apologise in advance if I don't get everyone to answer every question. It's more a question of trying to get every question on the table. So the first questions are from uh, John Finney. John. And for members present, th thank you for your contributions, your, your written contributions. I'm going to roll this all in, in, into one because we're pressed for time. But it is about the, the current level of investment in the, the Clyde and Hebrides ferry service and whether it's being used effectively. What implications that has in the future uh, for uh, the impact it may have on the resilience uh, for the islands for the future? And it is indeed that in line with the Scottish Government's position on the islands? But the islands, well, now the Islands Act. So. Where are we? Where are we going, sir? Who'd like to head off with that? Um, Angus, why don't you start? Well, can I first of all say that the community board's been in existence for less than, than a, a year, but we've done an awful lot of work along. We have membership from 14 members right across from Aaron to, to Lewis. Um, the most common feedback we've had in our year in existence is that the level of, of investment is not adequate to maintain or indeed improve service and that has been quite loud. I will qualify that by saying there is an appreciation of the, the large sums that have gone into particular projects, if we could put it that way. What communities do question is, has that been used wisely and effectively? And um, I listened with interest to the, the talk of the, the Stornoway to Ullapool route, for instance. I attended all the public meetings that took place with another hat on. Um, I think the, the option of the two ferries was certainly not on the table in the way it was suggested. Um, I remember one slide going up saying those two options and 37 going up saying the large vessel is the option. Um, communities really do question whether what they can bring to the table is included in, in the planning and they would like the opportunity to be part of that. Um, there is a place there, I think, for the views from the communities and the users. I would say very clearly that um, the strategy going ahead is one thing that people question very often when you engage with communities. What is the long-term plan? How do we build on a very successful RET? How do we then maximise the, uh, the benefits that have come with RET? And there's no doubt that in terms of the Islands Act, people are asking the equality question and the island proofing question and I have no doubt that will come back at some point. Roy, you may have a, a, a different opinion. Um, when uh, you compare the investment, recent and future potential, uh, in, in the current uh, CalMax email system, it compares very unfavourably with best practice elsewhere. And by elsewhere, I mean in particular Scandinavia, where there's a model of operation which uh, is very much more cost effective than what he, we have, but also within Scotland itself there are operators that provide services at much less cost, uh, better services at less cost than, than the CalMac uh, operation. Now, to, to give you examples of those is Western Ferries across the Clyde that operates without any subsidy at all, makes a good profit in fact on, on its routes, it has invested in its own terminals um, and it carries so far as I can recall, more traffic in terms of cars and, and, and lorries than all the other Clyde routes put together. Now, my, my, that might be worth checking, but it's pretty close if it's not I exactly so. Then there's Pentland Ferries, whose vessel, uh, Pentalina, and a new one, uh, a larger catamaran ferry uh, about to be delivered, costing £14 million, as opposed to the not much less capacity than the Glen Sanox at close on £50 million. Now, Pentland Ferries, again, operates without subsidy. Um, it's, the emissions are half those of the, the, the competing Northlink service. The uh, fuel consumption, of course, is, is half that. Also, it's clean diesel fuel, not, not a heavy, heavy uh, fuel, uh, very polluting heavy fuel, and it's carrying the majority of cars, passengers and trucks across the Pentland Firth. So one operator is, is winning the business without any public subsidy whatsoever, including capital costs and terminal costs, and the competing operation, and that's not CalMac, of course, it's Northlink, but um, a similar style of operation, 
uh, is uh, costing something like £10 million pounds a year. Um, the key reasons for that is um, the catamaran design in that case, which is operating, uh, I say, in, in, in rough waters. The Pentland Firth is notorious uh, for being a rough water area. Um, uh, the, the, the hull design is such, it's, it's less draft, it's uh, it narrow hulls, so it's got a, a low, what's called a, a low block coefficient, which means you need much less power to drive it through the water, which means less fuel consumption, which means less CO2. She also has half the crew, less than half the crew, of the Northlink alternative. Now that, uh, the catamaran technology is maybe slightly different from the, the norm in Norway for, for vehicle ferries, but, but that aside, the, um, uh, the comparison is very stark. And, and that, the Norwegian approach is keep the crewing down, um, you have the passenger capacity to ration, a ratio of about three or four to one, uh, whereas the, the CalMac norm is seven to one, which means you carry a large and unnecessary crew because the passenger capacity is rarely, if ever, used on, on, on most, of the, most of the routes. Um, um, maybe, can I just a further sentence or so? Um, the terminal designs and another aspect, if you take Western Ferries, for example, it requires one person to berth the vessel um, because the, 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 the link span locks onto, onto the vessel and that's operated from the ship. Same in Norway. You've got large ferries in Norway, the, 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 the berthing is done by one hand on the boat. For, for CalMac operation, it takes nine people, three forward, three aft and three on the shore. So. Um, Crewing is, is a major, major cost. Now, uh, as we go on in, the, in, in our presentation, I'm not saying that there are going to be redundancies because if we use a more efficient, a medium-sized ships, we can have more ships, more frequency on routes and be employing roughly the same number of people. That's certainly more than a sentence, Roy. Uh, Ranald, would you like to come in? And, and Rob, do you want to come in on that as well? That's fine, if, if I may then. Um, it's just to start by saying I was enormously encouraged by the evidence we've heard already this morning. I think there's an awful lot of agreement in positions in terms of our own, our own stance on we, the way we see um, ferry service deployment going in the future. Um, I do think that um, some of the more recent decision making, which has followed a lengthy period of underinvestment, and it's not a political thing, it's, you know, we, we went 10 years without a major vessel. Um, from the MV Hebrides entering service in 2001 to the Finlagen entering service in 2011. Um, and that's a significant part of the, the issues that we've been seeing, I think, and in, in particularly evidently this year, um, are stemming from that. Um, I do think that some of the recent decisions were not ones that we would have welcomed. Um, the decision to go for a single large ferry on Stormy Ullipal was not in alignment with the STAG appraisal that was undertaken on that route. I, um, I did he note the reference to a further technical piece of work that I don't think um, has been made public, so um, that perhaps came along after the, the STAG appraisal, but that was what you know, the community wanted. That was the message that came from a wide swathe of stakeholders. There was no such exercise for um, Hull 802, indeed, nor was it for Hull 801, um, the, the bigger ferries for Aaron and the shared operation of the two routes across the Little Minch. Um, the consequence of that, in looking at Transfer Scotland's own forecasting and the network strategy group that we heard reference his own forecasting, is that um, we have had the welcome announcement of the new ferry for Eiley, with Eiley having serious um, constraints at the moment, and 2021 has a forecast of an 85% constrained demand on the route to Eiley. But, um, after the introduction of the new, the new ship that's in build at Ferguson's and following the introduction of Loch Seaforth, um, the routes to the Western Isles will all be in the high 70s. So that means that, um, and the, the VRDP set out a, what above 70% means, and it means get another ferry. You may frequently not be able to get on the one you want, and that's over a whole given day. Um, and it means that the alternative ferries, so for Malagloch Boys still, for Uig to Loch Maddy, Uig to Tarbert, and Stornway to Ullipal, that's some 26,500 people. You can look for an alternative ferry, but it's highly likely that it will not be available, and that's following a very substantial investment. So I think that the case for more ferries in the network, more frequency, 
opening up the, the opportunities that that accessibility brings to these communities um, is what we, we need to see moving forward. I think it's a message that communities will, would be giving. Uh, unfortunately, for the Little Minch investment, that opportunity wasn't there. There has been substantial consultation after the big decision was taken about the, the solution. We need to move away from that. I'm confident that the Island Scotland Act and the Community Empowerment Act, will, which have both come along since these decisions were taken, will mean that we wouldn't end up there again. And also, I'm confident that the, 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 you know, the agencies involved, Transport Scotland, CMAL, CALMAC, are, are all committed to, to that sort of consultation and that sort of openness as well. So sorry if I've been a bit long-winded with that. I'm just mindful that Rob may not like you for, as I, if I had to cut down his answer. Rob? Lots of the points have been covered. The ferries to the Western Isles or Outer Hebrides, whichever you want to use, are already over Transport Scotland's recommended capacity. Um, the actual new ferry will enter service above its Transport Scotland's recommended capacity. And you've already heard about additional growth going forwards. We won't have any additional capacity for another two years. And that causes concern both amongst businesses and communities, both in terms of their business and how to grow it. There's no incentive for growth at the moment because we can't get people there. 80% of our visitors come on the ferries. And if we can't get them there, you're just taking share from your neighbour. You're not growing. You're not growing demand. We want to grow business. There's a lots of enthusiasm there. Uh, it was good to hear. I think Angus covered it. There is lots of community support for a small two-boat service. I think the consultation in both cases in the last two um, exercises was strongly in support of a two-boat service. And in both cases, we have ended up with one larger vessel, which has resulted in significant investment in port facilities. Um, it's good to hear that that's beginning to change. It's unfortunate that it's happening now. John, do you want to... Uh, just very briefly, if I may. Uh, and it's to pick up on uh, some of Mr Peterson's comments there and indeed others that are in the statement about... Uh, you, you, I don't know if you were present when I asked about the involvement of the trade union movement in the ferry deployment plan and procurement. Um, clearly, they would have some concerns, particularly about terminology like building hotels on top of ferries and the like. Would, would you see that it would be important that they were involved, that there was any discussion about future ferry design? Yes, I, I, I think so. Um, it, it's important that uh, the terms and conditions of, of work are, are uh, uh, up to a, a, a standard that, uh, that, that uh, obtains across the industry, at the very least. Um, I, I'm not sure how expert trade unions are in the, in the actual design of ferries, you know, appropriate design for, for, for key routes and so on, but uh, they certainly should be uh, consulted as to uh, the operating methods. That's not to say that operating methods should not change, because um, one of the recommendations in my own paper is that we should move gradually to shore-based crews and basing the crews on the island communities uh, served by the ferries. Now, that would, um, that would answer the Scottish Government's priorities for islands of increasing population and improving economic activity, it would increase school roles and so on. So um, I think change is necessary, but that change can be done in consultation. Very, very quickly, and Roy's slightly covered it, but I was just going to say that that incremental change, it's not going to happen overnight. No. If we're going to move to new fleets of ferries, you know, we're talking about a 30-year strategy here. Um, it would be very good to see an increased local employment as part of that. We absolutely get that that requires um, education establishments locally to step up to the mark more than they maybe have been in the past. We need to offer the ability to train people in marine jobs more local to the, the ports, but at the moment um, there are in my opinion, not enough um, people in, say, the Western Isles, as an example, who are actually employed in the delivery of the, the ferry services that are their, their, you know, their, their bread and water, essentially. And it would be good to see that increase. And it would also help address what has become the, 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 the concerning demographic shift towards the ageing population and the, the lack of... Well, I, I'm, a, I, I, I'm, I'm a native of North US and I don't live there any longer. And the, there are very few who, of my classmates who do as well and it would be good to, to retain people like me in, in the islands. Um, not that I'm necessarily offering to relocate. I might have to clear some domestics for that. So. Um, Angus, I know you want to come in, but we are pushed. Let's see if I can get you in on the next one. Stuart, you... you... Uh, I, I just want to move straight to a very simple question that you heard the other panel uh, about uh, integration of transport links. Um, you 
I think you all heard the answers that we got. Is there anything more you could say on that subject? Perhaps starting with Angus in particular. Who... I think it is a common feedback that we get that um, the onward links from the ferries don't always match and you hear different stories about buses leaving three minutes before a ferry comes in, um, the ability to, to hold other forms of transport back. Um, I think there's been improvements in that and certainly in some areas, but there is still room for improvement and it ties in also, I think, with the, um, from the, the, the disability point of view and for people needing to access. Um, a lot of our facilities are, um, are because they are old facilities, both in terms of vessels and make it difficult, and the newer ones we seem to be, be coping for it. Um, but there is constantly a, an ask for better connection and better tie-up between the different forms of transport. I must say, personal experience, some time ago, I put my case in the hold of the bus in Inverness and got it in the pier at Stornoway, and I thought that was really good. Anyway, anyone else? I don't think that facility is available any longer, but um, uh, anyway, the, the point I was going to make is that the, the nature of the current ferries means that there is um, a lot of passenger accommodation on them. There is no constraint to travelling to and from our islands as a foot passenger. There absolutely is a constraint in terms of the cardex, but we should and could and should be doing an awful lot more to improve the integration of um, other modes of travel from the ports. Um, that, that is something that you know, organisations like Hytrans could do a lot more about as well. Um, we, we have taken some steps forward in, in that respect, but there's often steps back as well. Um, and the, the recent example of the, the, one of the two new routes that CalMac have introduced was the Malagloch Boystil route, which failed to connect with trains. Mm -hmm. And you know, getting these basics right, they've addressed it. They've, I think three days of the week now, the, the connection is available for four. So that, that, is, that is good so progress. Just, just, just to be clear, what you're saying is we could, if we get this right, help more people to use public transport rather than private transport with all the benefits that might derive from that? Public transport. Um, we need to make other options available like car clubs and um, you know, easy to get remote car hire. Um, you know, we, we just need to, to, to make sure there are facilities in place at airports that make it much easier for people to travel to and from them without their car. Uh, I'm going to actually bring Jamie in to see if I can widen it out a bit and then we're going to have to move on to the next question. Jamie. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, just following on from the, the scenario you said, where there is availability for passengers but not for cars, I think that's probably commonplace across, across much of the network, uh, a huge sense of frustration amongst uh, drivers and businesses. Uh, do you think there's a space uh, for a discussion around uh, easing pressure on the vessels by removing some of the cargo uh, or commercial uh, vehicles off of passenger services onto, for, for example, dedicated uh, uh, cargo or commercial services, and be that publicly or privately operated is, is another discussion, but uh, would that free up much needed space on some of these uh, CalMAC services? Roy, I'll bring you in briefly. I, I know of two private operators who would be very keen to operate between Isla and the mainland on a freight-only basis and a non-subsidised basis as well. So the opportunities there. I, Isla's got the third biggest freight uh, freight um, a volume a, of any island group in, a, 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 in, in Scotland. And, and the, the opportunities are there. Private operators would be willing to do it, um, yeah, but, but, so long as they were not undermined in, in the process. Yeah. So my question is, why, why isn't that not happening? What would need to happen to, to enable that to, to, to go forward? Encourage private operators to do it. Okay. Um, no. Actually, we talked a lot about vessels, but there are actually quite a few things. Roy's just mentioned one. There are lots of operational constraints on the vessels which limit capacity, uh, both operating practices and schedules. Um, I think CalMAC would say that they don't have the budget to operate some of those facilities. There is more capacity on Swanaway Ullapool. It runs a freight service overnight, which often isn't full and may be of use, but it's not actually allowed. People aren't allowed to use it. So there are capacities in the system and there are lots of constraints around that. Um, the Harris, South of Harris service, which runs at 97%, is supposedly to run at 97%, only is allowed to run during daytime hours because of constraints on, on safety. So there are things that we could do in addition to services. I would just mention bikes as well. 
lots of growth in cycle use on the islands, and it's actually one of the areas where we can be more sustainable. Uh, lots of demand from both visitors and, uh, and islanders in the use of service. And the, the ferries are not necessarily all set up to actually take the bikes. Uh, we're getting problems with people not being able to actually move bikes around the network. Um, we're going to move on. I'm um, sorry, Ronald. We're going to move on to the next question, which is Richard Lyle. I'll see if I can bring yeah, you Yeah, good morning, gentlemen. Um, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Uh, I have to say, I, I don't want a deregulated ferry service. I want uh, the service that we've got. OK, and I've got nothing against private. I've, I've been on Western ferries. But uh, unfortunately, a ferry is not like a dinghy. You can't just take it off the wall, blow it up and stick it in the water. You've got to build it. And, you know, what was built in the past maybe is not suitable for today. So what, you know, and I saw actually one or two of you shaking your head when I asked this question earlier, when you were in the audience. Are you satisfied with the progress or process of engagement with island communities over ferry procurement? And if not, why not? Me, I think it was nodding our heads. I think maybe you got, and I, I think my earlier answer really reflected uh, in part the question that you'd asked earlier on that in the past, I don't think consultation with island communities has been as good as it should have been, or other key stakeholders, including the hauliers as well, who are an important uh, customer in the, the mix. But um, I hope, I hope things will be different in the future. So I think that was the, the point. Yes, I think uh, I would have been nodding my head in agreement for you bringing that point up because I think it's, uh, it is absolutely critical that we in, improve that input into the, the process. I think a lot of communities would ask, can you evidence where we have actually changed any of the decision making in the past? And it's difficult to see where we have. So we've got to be real about this. I think they have a much more obvious upfront part to play in the design of services, and they should be included in that from the beginning. So, so basically, um, Angus, you're on the, the Calmark Community Board. You're the chair. So is that you now feed into Calmark and say, no, don't do that, or my uh, our, our members say da 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 da? We've, we're finding our feet, if you like, in the first year, but our. our Remit is to feed into the Calmac board, and I go into the Calmac board I want by invitation. Ask, but yep. we have recently done a piece of work which might be of interest to the committee by one of our subcommittees, looking at the operational constraints and the planning issues by one of our subgroups, a three month piece of work, where it became apparent that we are now facing not just Calmac, Transport Scotland's input to Transport Scotland into CMAL, and I was going to offer to pass that on to the committee maybe after. This meeting as a, I think as you should do that because we all, I think everybody wants to work together to, to solve this problem. Um, I'll move on. Recent procurement decisions have favoured larger vehicles, uh, vessels over more medium sized vehicles. Are you content, content with these decisions? And do you think the procurement decisions have provided go, good value for money or not? With Roy on that. Content. I, I, I think it has been a mistake. I think there are ways around this. Um, if we take, for example, the, um, what has been called the sky triangle, it's not, of course, a triangle, it's a, it's a V. Uh, there's not, the other part of the, the, the triangle is missing. Um, it's not too late, I think, to move to a two ship. A scenario there, which would obviate the need for major uh, uh, improvements to terminals. We need some uh, improvements, maintenance. Um, I, I suggest that the new ship, the, the sister of Glen Sannox, be uh, redeployed elsewhere. And where I would suggest is Scrabster Stromness. Now, um, she's an LNG burning ship. The LNG will have to come from the south of England. That by lorry. That requires a round trip of over a thousand miles of a lorry burning diesel to bring this supposedly um, green fuel to uh, run this ship. Orkney has a supply of LNG, so the ship would be suitable for Scrabster Stromness. It's not suitable for Uig, uh, um, Uig Lochmaddy and Tarbert because the one ship solution has always been no good because the timetable varies each day. It's an unuser friendly timetable. Two ships would provide a far superior service, would double the ca capacity of, of the present, which the new ship will not. The new ship will bring a marginal increase in capacity. And, and it can be done at a cost no more than the large ship and major upgrades to terminals, but will generate more revenue. 
therefore hopefully cost less money overall. Would anyone like to offer a different view on the, the, the panel to that? Ranald? Not a different view, but just to, to expand on it. I think um, the, the, uh, for reasons I've said earlier, um, the, the, the big single vessel replacing slightly small, you know, another vessel doesn't feel like the right solution. I don't think it's adding in, in terms of accessibility and frequency, which will drive the economy. Um, but I do think we need to now plan ahead. We need to understand where the next problems are in the network. Unfortunately, some of those problems are where the most recent investment has been. But we still need to, to, to understand um, Transport Scotland have made great strides forward in forecasting ahead and understanding what the, the issues are going to be in the network. And we now need to plan for the next 20 or 30 years. And that would be, for me, Mull, Eilie, um, the Little Minch, and um, look at the vessel age elsewhere as well, because there are some that do need to be replaced. I, I just don't get this, right? Um, I need to get a bigger vehicle, uh, vessel because more vehicles want to come to my island. But you're now saying, no, it should be a smaller one. Two. Are you basically saying two smaller ones, which will then go back and forward, back and forward? Right, OK. Just, just sorry, if, if I may, as an example of that, you cannot do a day trip from the Western Isles to the mainland. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of, um, to, to put that population into perspective, it's the inability, and I'm looking at the convener for this, to make a day trip from Elgin to Aberdeen or Inverness. So that, that's what the, the current timetabling that we have for the, the Western Isles, that's just picking, picking that example. Frequency. We'll drive frequency, Thank we'll you. open up new markets. That's, well, that's, that's what I wanted to know. Thanks. Well, I'm not sure it's a good, good ploy to put the convener on the spot, but he always likes to be brought into the conversation. Jamie Green, yours is the next co question. Uh, thanks, Green. I can ask, uh, uh, we have a lot of expertise on the panel uh, here, and I would like to ask in your professional opinion what you think should have happened over the last 10 years. Uh, I, I, but more importantly, and I think we all want to look forward, is what should we be doing now? What should the Scottish Government be doing now to improve the situation, specifically on the, on the CHIFS network, um, to uh, alleviate the situation, given that we know that we're operating at maximum capacity with little to no resilience at the moment. I guess you're all going to have a view on this. Um, I'm not sure who wants to come in first. You're all looking the other way at the moment. Uh, OK, now you're all volunteering. Angus, we'll start with you and then we'll work along the line. If I could ask you to keep your answers succinct, I'd be grateful. Yeah, we'll keep it short because I think it's quite uh, a sensible approach just to to sit down and say how are we going to plan this into the 5, 10, 15 year future for ferry services and do we want these ferry services to be part of, of growing the economies of these islands or um, do we not? And I think then it's, it takes you back to looking at how do we finance that, how do we put the finance behind that and that might mean we have to look at new ways of raising finance. We can look at other countries where you have publicly owned ferry services that actually go to the market to get finance, for instance. There are options there, and I think it would be good if government had a look at what's our ambition for, for the islands, for the places these ferry serves, have a new baseline, and start working up a long-term plan. No long-term plan is, is any use if you don't have the finance behind that, and that is a challenge we recognise, but there are other ways of looking at that as well. Ram. Just, just to, to perhaps build on that, um, I would um, look to undertake the, the right appraisal. Um, so by saying that, I'm not going to say what all the answers are to it. But um, I think the, the government are making the, the, the good step of undertaking a stag study that looks at all of the services to the Outer Hebrides, to and from and within the Outer Hebrides. I would um, roll that process on to a similar um, piece of work looking at the services that, are current, that the communities currently serve from Oban. Um, and understand what those communities want, what the, the long-term planning is for those areas. I think Eilie, um with the, the, the new second vessel, will actually be addressed, and it's based around the principles that were developed through a stag analysis anyway of two-vessel service for Eilie. It looks as if Aaron's going to be pretty well there. So I think we're making some, some good, good progress, but I think we need to undertake some appraisal and then understand what, what that tells us about the, the, the most appropriate steps. Also, maybe bring in some of these other softer measures that we can do to manage demand. Roy. Yep. Um, one of the papers I submitted to the expert ferry group was called West Coast Ferry Scoping Study. That really sets out the, the, the scenario. It's uh, medium-sized vessels, simpler vessels, shore-based crewing, um, using um, shorter routes and uh, land bridges such as Mull for Colin Tyree, 
uh, Isla, Jura, short, short routes. Uh, it's all set out in the paper. If it can be distributed to you, I think uh, that's better than a long answer from me. Thank you. Rob? Uh, a long-term plan is necessary. There's a review underway, which is absolutely crucial for the Outer Hebrides services in combination. I think there is broad support for, short, for smaller, more frequent services that open up uh, new markets and a ferry plan that links into the overall economic plan for the islands and is not disjointed from it. Uh, um, I have to ask, I, I'm now totally confused. I thought we had a ferries plan that we all agreed, but it seems that everyone who's been here this morning said this, that no one agrees with it. Is that a fair assumption or is that a, a, a not a fair assumption? I think it's been superseded and I think events have gone ahead of that ferries plan. The challenge maybe I was talking about is how we develop a new ferries plan that reflects the ambitions of the, of, of the islands that are served. OK, so you, none of, no one's disagreed with that. John? Now, as this session's progressed, uh, we've, we've heard a reference, uh, and I wonder if uh, more frequent references to Transport Scotland. Maybe they should be on, have been at the end of the table too. Can you explain the role they play? Because uh, it, it seems that um, they are pivotal, um, and uh, I'm not entirely sure that I understand where they fit in the scheme of things. To be tactful on on that topic. Um, but I think there is a case for a new management structure to uh, address the issue of ferries in Scotland. I'm going to try that out a bit by bringing Maureen in and then ask anyone else if they want a question. Yes, thank you, Convener. Gentlemen, as this session has gone on, it strikes me that we're, we keep talking about it needs, we need a replacement vessel on this route and that route. Surely we should be looking at what Scotland needs in terms of ferries, including Northlink, um, because I would have thought there was some crossover between Aberdeen to Orkney and Shetland and uh, Alapool to Stornoway. Surely we should be looking at the range of types of vessels so that you get more ability to swap vessels around on routes when required. And I don't get that feeling coming from any of the answers so far. I'm going to bring Ranald in. I see everyone else nodded there almost. Yes, they all did nod. Ranald. I think at the moment um, there is a vessel replacement deployment plan that just looks at the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services. That should also take in the Northern Isles ferry services. I think it seems absolutely right and proper that the ferry services the Scottish Government are funded are looking, looked at in the whole. Um, I do think in terms of Transport Scotland's um, you know, uh, position in all of this, I think you know, th they are working. You know, I think... Um, Seamal and Calmac did do a good job of presenting what their role is, which is essentially to be government's agency to take the responsibility for the ferry services. Um, and it is a very, very challenging one as well. I think we've, I took a lot of heart, as I say, from the fact that I think, you know, we're recognising that, you know, the, 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 you know, the demand we're dealing with is very, very different. And we now have to perhaps pivot and change the, the way we're looking to, to, to cope with that demand. And I don't think, you know, I think we all we will all work together on that as well. I think there's a real sense of shared, shared sense of purpose. Briefly bring in Jamie and then we'll move on to the next subject. Thanks. Um, I think Maureen makes a, an excellent point uh, about looking at the bigger picture. Is there some, some, something fundamentally flawed in the way that, that the whole thing is operating at the moment? Uh, we know uh, that we need uh, around £850 million, that was said in the previous panel, to replace the current fleet, notwithstanding any future growth. Um, and they're getting around you know, half of that at the moment in terms of investment. Um, we know there are private operators out there who could perhaps operate unsubsidised on routes, uh, op, you know, delivering uh, environmentally friendly, efficient, reliable services. Uh, is there something fundamentally wrong in the way that Transport Scotland is approaching the tender processes, the franchise model, the ownership model, the operational routes and the licences that they operate? Is there another way of looking? Should there be another way of looking at this? It seems like a huge question. Um, I think there, there has been a tendency to do things as they always have been done and changing them a little bit on the margins rather than looking at the system as a whole and um, as Scandinavians have done and uh, coming up with a, with a plan that really does both address the needs of the islands but prov provides the required services in, in a cost-efficient manner. I'll bring Angus in and then I'm afraid we have got to move on to the next question, Angus. Yeah, very briefly, I think there is a, 
I need to, to look at the model and how it works, but I think we also have to um, realise CalMAC employees are part of the communities of, that they serve, and there would be from the communities a, a, a protection, if you like, on making sure that the, the, the value that they've given into the system is, is maintained. Um, we have seen other operators come in on the Stornoway route to, to run a freight ferry before, um, and that, that hasn't been long-term successful. But I, I think there's no doubt that there is a need to have a, a complete look at how we supply these services. Um, but growing economies of the islands they serve, I think, should sit alongside that as part of, of that discussion so that we do not inadvertently cause any harm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Colin, yours is the next question. Th thanks, Convener. So, so far, we've focused, obviously, on uh, the issues around replacement of ferries, by and large. But can I ask the panel uh, to, to, to consider the issue around the port infrastructure itself? And are there any specific ports that you believe are in need of uh, significant investment? Rob, do you want to go on that? Or? Uh, we um, have a particular strategy to build in island traffic down the Western Isles of the Outer Hebrides. Um, the particular service, which has been very successful, uh, we have a thing called Hebridean Way, where you can walk and cycle it, but we have lots of other things you can, you can do on the way down. And the, certainly the service across the Sound of Harris is um, between, well, Bernera and, and South Harris is really under pressure, both in terms of volume, but also it's just about hanging in there. Um, it needs investment in all sorts of ways, um, on port, uh, on the boat, and actually on the route between between the two. So that's a particular particular concern for our industry because it, it holds the, the whole thing together. So there's, as well as getting people to the islands, there's also moving people around once they're, they're on the islands. Uh, that's a particular concern for us. Um, in terms of other areas, you've already heard there's been actually quite a big investment in the Outer Hebrides um, both planned and future in terms of Stormway Port and um, and Tarbot and Loch Maddy being upgraded with the new vessels. Uh, w when you're answering, I mean, when the committee went out to Mull, there were comments about, uh, and we certainly saw more camper vans going out to the islands and the, the, the pressure that put on infrastructure. Do you want to comment on that? I mean, who would like to go next? It's just something through Roy. Well, it, it's in my paper. I, I feel that camper vans uh, ought not to be uh, it, uh, given the advantage of road equivalent tariff because the, the, it, the mostly tourist day uh, vehicles, uh, the camper van users tend not to use local accommodation. They can often tend to bring their own food with them from their own supermarkets. So they contribute very little, very often, to the island economies. So I don't think they should benefit from, uh, from uh, subsidised travel. I'm not sure Angus agrees, Angus. <laughs> wouldn't agree from, um, from an island economy that needs everything it can get to start refusing to, to carry. I think I know businesses that have built up on the back of, of camper vans coming to the islands. I know individual businesses that do get spend. I don't think we're in a position can we can say that we do not want any form of input into our economy at this moment with the population challenges as we've got, with the, uh, the challenge of finding work for young people to stay there. And it goes back to one of the questions earlier about RET. Because something is successful, let's not look at finding a financial penalty to stop it growing. Let's look at how we can maximise that. Because if you do go down that route, it is the poorest people who will suffer in terms of losing access to these services. And there are people on our islands who go and travel in camper vans to get their holiday on the mainland. And I know some people who just couldn't afford to do that before. So let, let's not just take a broad brush to this. We have to maximise what we've got. Angus, we're, we're definitely going to get a chance to look at RET in a minute. Um, so, uh, Jamie, you had a specific question on a specific area. Yeah, I mean, on, on the issue of ports, we've heard a, we've had a lot of discussion this morning around you know whether two vessels, smaller vessels, are better than one big vessel. But a byproduct of making those decisions is the effect it has on the port infrastructure and whether or not those ports at, at present are currently suitable for larger vessels. The example being the Adros and Brodick route. Uh, obviously, Brodick has had its investment. But the decision to put a larger vessel on that route also means that our drossing will require significant investment. 
uh, and, and potentially temporary relocation to a competitive port in the interim. Um, do you think enough goes into the decision-making process around looking at the bigger picture when choosing which vessel needs to be built uh, around the consequences that will have on the cost of improving the ports in which those vessels have to serve? Yeah, exactly what I was looking to come in with in the earlier question. I think um, it is acknowledged that in Audit Scotland's work on, on ferries that there should be an infrastructure investment plan in a similar way as we have a vessel replacement and deployment plan. I'm not qualified to say where the investments needed in the infrastructure, but I do feel that the two, the two cannot you know, work apart. They need to happen together. Um, we need to understand the, the full implications of the infrastructure. We've heard evidence already today around say, the, the Stornoe Ullapal one, which actually saw significant investment in Stornoe, where a new pier was built for the previous ferry in the mid, mid to late 90s. So, um, you know, we've almost invested in the infrastructure where it was the, the, you know, the freshest in the network. Um, there absolutely are challenges. I think that this, the quality of facilities at um, terminals is important as well, because that's pretty variable. So, you know, you've got Brodick on the one hand, but if you, you know, having travelled through Craig Newer to, to go, go, go to Mull, you'll have seen a, a dearth of facility, uh, I think a, a large waiting shelter that, that I trans funded in 2002 as a main passenger facility. That I think we've had people um, actually, you know, become unwell standing in that in the, the fine summer we've had. So, you know, there needs to be some consistency and some, you know, some, you know, basic basics that each port should have as well. But I, I do think that that would that would help. I'm, I'm going to bring Gail Ross in uh, now, just on on the on this sort of area of investment in ports. Thanks, convener. Good morning, panel, again. Um, yeah, just to go back to the question that I asked the first panel about accessibility for people with um, mobility um, issues, do you think sufficient consideration is given to people with um, extra mobility needs when designing ports come in? Um, I know that, um, Rob, in your written evidence, you said basically what was said before, that the newer vessels are good, but you know there's an issue with the older vessels as well. So maybe if you want to expand on that um, too. Yeah, I, um, I would actually commend the operating procedures. I am a personal user of that service, and uh, certainly for mobility assistance, it depends if it's visually impaired or, or there's hearing issues. I, I can't comment on those. Um, actually, the operating procedures and the attitude of the the people on the the vessel is great. I think it's better if you're in a vehicle because you get access directly onto the thing. If you're a foot passenger, you probably have to go through more steps and that's probably more challenging in those things. So I think as the replacements are coming on, um, those uh, considerations are being brought in, being fully borne into account. Certainly I'm, I'm not an expert on accessibility, but as a user, um, my father has mobility concerns and uh, it seems to be uh, reflected. Um, it is the, the legacy, the legacy systems, both particularly in ports and on vessels. It's just running through that we have this age of vessels. Uh, I'll bring Ranald in, and then I'm afraid we are going to have to go on to RET, which I, I know is an issue. Uh, Ranald. As brief as possible, I, th I think um, the operator does an absolutely excellent job of um, managing their people with reduced mobility. I think um, they, they have a, a good track record. I think the, the new investment has always placed the, you know, the, the accessibility needs of um, different stakeholders at the, uh, you know, as a priority. Um, I've, I've been involved in the Accessible Travel Framework and have worked closely with CalMAC and Northlink, indeed, on how they've been um, taking forward the, the, the needs of PRMs, and including um, some some test runs on, on ferries, and actually ferries, I think, perform very well compared to some other modes, if I'm perfectly honest. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's li li like everything, you know, dealing with age, older vessels, but even some of the, the older major vessels will, will still have lifts to at least one part of the ship as well. So that's going back to the, the Isle of Arran from era 1984. You know, we're, we're not, you know, you know they've, been doing, they've been doing a good job in this respect for at least 30 years. Uh, we're going to move on to the next section. John, that's you. Uh, yes, we already had mention of uh, RET, road equivalent uh, tariff, and uh, I hasten to add I'm, I'm not, I don't use a camper van, I, I use a tent when I'm visiting, so I suppose my input into island economies is limited, as I don't stay in a hotel. Um, but, uh, I mean, clearly there's a lot of hopes for RET. 
it appears to have had a big impact. Have there been both pluses and minuses, would you say? You'd like to, uh, Roy, I, I, I... The original architect of RET in 1974, when I was a very young transport research officer with the Highlands Islands Development Board, what I would say was it, 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 the RET idea was of its time. And it seems to have been a, a, a considerable success in generating traffic. Um, but I think there's scope for improvement. Um, it, it doesn't reflect modern yield management techniques. In other words, uh, you charge more at peaks. And I think there's scope for that. I think there's scope for giving islanders, island residents, including camper van owners, uh, more moderate fares than visitors. We've, we've had a lot of uh, talk recently about tourist taxes, and yet uh, we are heavily subsidising tourists to go to, to islands at the same time. I think the balance has to be struck somewhere al along the way. Um, I think I, I probably won't say any more than that, other than there's scope for more flexibility to generate more revenue, to regulate capacity and to still benefit the island communities. Ranulph. Um, I, I think RET, you know, I, I would hope that we're not in danger of um, treating the symptom instead of the disease here as well. I think RET has um, had a, as significant an impact on island economies as anything else I can think of in, in, in my memory, um, which was actually since 1974, though, so I'm... Um, hey. Uh, uh, but um, I, I do think that RET has, has done a tremendous job of um, delivering new people and increasing the profile and demand and desire for people to travel to the islands. Um, it's also clearly um, grown the propensity to travel for, of islanders, but I think that's a good thing as well. Um, I, I do think that it's not absolutely consistent because um, some islanders have more access to RET, if, if you, as it were, than others because they have more ferry services because of distance from mainland or other factors. Um, whether that leaves some scope for some ways of managing demand, um, um, Mr Green mentioned the possibility of make, that you could incentivise travel for um, hauliers on lower, you know, lower demand sailings because you make it a bit cheaper for them without breaking RET itself. There, there's lots of things that could be done. Um, within it, but as a concept, I think we should try and actually we should try and manage the success that RET has has given. Could I press you on that? I mean, Mr. Peterson seemed to be suggesting that uh, we hadn't maybe got the balance right. I mean, I went to the Silly Isles in the summer without a car, and it cost me hundred pounds return. Uh, so, is it just that the, are the fares just too cheap? Is that is that the part of the problem? We could raise the fares a bit, and that would also help the management. Um, well, I, I think. Um, People living on the islands would not say they were, they were too cheap. Um, from a, if you've got to differentiate with tourism, where do you stop in terms of what classifications you put on people's travel? I have really worries. The, the tourism industry is hugely important to, to the islands, and I wouldn't like to see that taking a backward step. We're still in a position on the islands where many economies are going backwards, where we're not keeping young people and we're not providing employment. If we as a country want to put investment into islands and RET is a good vehicle for that, I would say, to pardon the pun. But I also think that if we are evaluating RET, it should be done in a very um, holistic way and look at all the costs, that, the benefits that come back in against the costs of it. There is no doubt there has been um, a huge improvement in people being able to live a more equal life in the islands in terms of accessibility. You look at your health services, you look at uh, what comes into the exchequer in terms of tax paid on these activities that are now taking place in the island. So if we're evaluating RET, please let's not do it in a vacuum in terms of just the cost that puts in. It's, let's have a look at the outcome as well. Clarification, I mean, I understand Transport Scotland are going to do a review of RET in 2019. Do you, do you understand it will cover all these issues or will it not cover all these issues? I haven't got the detail on just how wide it's going to look, but I've already expressed on behalf of the community board to Transport Scotland our fear that it will be... Um, less than a holistic look. So I would, uh, I would certainly encourage us to look at all aspects when we do, let, do that evaluation. Uh, from an islander's perspective, this is a, a, an amazing thing. And the principle of people not being discriminated for choosing to live on an island 
is great. It has been a big boom for the tourism industry. It's not the only thing that's happened in the tourism industry in the last six years. Uh, on the islands, there has been a significant amount of demand, so we have tried to grow the industry ourselves as well, um, but RET has been a big help to it. Um, I think Roy mentioned yield management. There is no difference in fare for a tourist, whether you go in December or in July. Um, in those things. That's right. so, I, th I thought there was different levels of fares yeah, for CalMac. Not anymore. No. I see, right, okay. So that, um, and I think if you separate out, I, I, again, I would separate out the island perspective from the, the visitor perspective. If you think of the visitor as an in investment in generating demand and look at yield management techniques, I think we could, even without price, we could use yield management much more effectively across the network. Um, but it, it would help the communities significantly if we can stimulate traffic outside of the peak weeks. Because we are talking, all this conversation has been about a sort of four month peak in, in the summer. And it, at the other end of the season, we have to reverse. Um, you're all welcome to join me on the ferry in November. Um, and uh, I, we're pretty sure that you, we could get on it, assuming the weather, weather could work. So I think on the tourist side, there are things uh, that could be done uh, to help ensure the islands get a more visitor income from the same amount of investment. Um, thank you. Uh, the, the final two questions, I think, are Jamie, Jamie Green's. Just a brief follow-up on this. Um, I, I hear what Mr. Campbell saying about differentiation of users of ferries, but surely, you know, you know, I could cite numerous examples of uh, islanders from Iron that weren't able to get to the mainland to access hospital appointments. Uh, one constituent contacted me recently, couldn't get to a funeral on the mainland because the ferries are full. Um, and surely there, whatever is redesign happens, there must be a way of ensuring that islanders themselves are given some sort of priority on services uh, in the face of such numbers. And, and wouldn't that merit consideration? I would certainly agree that there has to be a, a method, particularly in those routes that are um, heavily used and short crossing. Aran is a perfect example of that, where we're aware of just what you said and finding some way of uh, making it easy for people to live on the island to make sure that they do access these things. Maybe what the point I was trying to make was um, let's not punish things to make that happen. Let's be ambitious and say how do we grow the, the capacity on these routes to allow people to, to access that. It's not a perfect world. You won't get anything. And there is tweaking that can be done to do that. And I agree with what, what others said. For instance, you know, a school minibus to go to a sports event is, is on the same level as uh, some of the commercial vehicles. These little things can be altered if we have the will. Um, but I think what I was trying to say was let's not use a hammer to, to sort out problems that might have an, an unknown consequences. But I would certainly agree that the basic right to access to services and to get to and from the mainland is something that should be available to islanders. Otherwise, you're, you're doing the opposite of what you're set out to do. Do you want to ask your final question on the tendering to, to the panel? Oh, do I have a final question? Apologies. I can begin. Um, No, no, it's fine. I just wasn't aware I had another follow-up, so bear with me. Um, I, OK, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, obviously there, there's a, a government strategy at the moment to uh, want to direct award contracts to CalMAC, and there's a process ongoing, and I believe we'll probably do some update on that. What is the panel's views on the current wider tender process? Who should be able to bid, whether a contract should be direct awarded, or, or whether, as we, we discussed earlier, that there is potential for uh, other operators to enter some of these markets and relieve some of those pressure points, especially during the peak seasons? Um, I'd love, love to give you each a very short opportunity to answer that. So, uh, Roy, why don't you start and then I'll work along that way and then come back to Rob at the end. The, Briefly, Ro the Roy. The present day tendering system is quite restrictive in that the incoming operator for the whole bundle is expected to have the same crews, same ships, same fares, same conditions, etc. There's no scope for innovation in that. So I think the tendering, the tender has to be made rather more open to, to, to invite innovation. Um, also, um, there, I 
believes there is scope for uh, smaller bundles, which makes, would make it easier for incoming operators to, to handle. Ranald. We, we've been pretty agnostic about the, the position around um, to tender or not to tender and how things move forward. We can see positive tendering and um, you know, engagement we've had. We, we, operate, we manage the, the we administer the ferry stakeholder groups for the CHIFS network and we, we've heard evidence at those that actually the tendering has been demonstrated to provide savings. Um, but at the same time, you know, clearly there would be savings in not having to tender in terms of some of the costs that are built in. But I think the, the feeling being that, that there is a net saving from that. But we, we've been broadly agnostic as an organisation and allowing that, that review to, to go forward. But it does seem to get mixed views from the communities as well when we've been at the different um, sessions on, you know, on consultation around the, the review, but really pretty agnostic. Angus, briefly. Very briefly. I'm, I've, I can bring no expertise at tendering to, to the table, and as a, as a board, we haven't discussed that. But there is a feeling, I think, that um, some form of benchmarking against the, the performance of the company would be, would be um, helpful. There is um, a worry about breaking up into different bundles. There always has been, when we've discussed that, across the network that you then let private companies cherry-pick the best routes and you end up with a public purse taking the more difficult routes to manage. So that, again, I think is a discussion I've been well involved in. I would, I would just maybe suggest a bit of caution towards that approach. Rob, do you want to add anything to that? No tendering expertise. Uh, the community, all opinions are expressed in the community. I think there's a strong affinity with CalMac uh, in the communities uh, which came out, but equally there's a frustration with the ferry service and a desire to make things done. I think uh, um, what Angus said in terms of there's different ways of getting to a better performance. Pick whichever one you think is appropriate. Um, I do think we talked about actually operation staff. This is a very remote debate from the communities in which we operate. It's large national organisations talking to other large national organisations in remote places. None of the management live in the communities in which they serve. They talk about things very emotively. But if more of them were based there, it's not just people running the boats. It's actually people taking the decisions there. I think that might have a bigger impact than your tendering process. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank all members of the panel for, for the answers they've given. Um, they've been very helpful. And I'm pleased we've managed to say we've managed to get through all of the questions. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting. Well, I'm now going to move the meeting into private session uh, and I'll allow the witnesses to depart as quickly as possible. Thank you. <laughs>